computer. Do you see that? Are you okay with that? I'm fine. I've I've had Great. so many zooms since last summer. So oh my, it's it's just it's crazy, isn't it? <laughs> right. I've been, I've been teaching via Zoom as well, so I have my my classes uh, because we we can't go in and teach in person, of course. So I've been teaching using Zoom since uh, last fall. And I've had a whole bunch of professional Zooms as well, so I'm, I'm quite comfortable with it. It's fine. I think I think we're all quite, as we say in German, ausgezoomed. <laughs> Does that mean burnt out? <laughs> yes, it means it means yeah. It's a yeah. It's just it's just it's crazy. I heard I heard somebody the other day. Uh, I think the chairman of the European Conservatories Union said, "Teaching music on Zoom is very much like." Digging a well with a spoon. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, you know, eh, that'll work. That'll work. Anyway, let me just give a slight intro as if, because then we'll we'll hang it into the other interview. Okay. Uh, and uh, I'm just thinking how to handle this best because. I was going to have you and Larry have a conversation, but we probably won't do that. It'd be too complicated. So I think what we're what I'll do is just welcome you and then we'll just and then we'll just cut it and then I'll announce that we're going to have a couple of parts and, and we've got a special edition of the interview. So so, ladies and gentlemen, as I promised you, we are going to have some wonderful uh, direct conversations with some of the. I hate the phrase living composers of today, but we have in this program in Hamburg, the celebration of black music, an extraordinary number of functioning, living, breathing voices of today, which is very exciting. And my guest sitting in front of me right now tonight is of course, Richard Thompson. Richard, wonderful and to meet you. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, a lot of these people, we are actually meeting ourselves for the first time in a digital world, uh, which is kind of miraculous on one side and kind of sad on the other side, but it does it does help concert life become less geographical. So let's embrace the good part of that. Yeah. Richard, we've had correspondence. We know of one another. Uh, we are uh, all sorts of things and we'll talk about that, but it is truly a pleasure to meet you. Welcome, welcome to Idodjo Live. Thank you so much. I, I'm really glad that after all these years, that we had the chance to actually meet, even though it's digitally, it's still very good. I think the first time I came across your music and you was your wonderful song cycle. I'm cutting right to the chase, two songs from which will be in our Hamburg program. Uh, but the Langston Hughes, and I think that it was because of, I think that um, uh, Daryl Taylor, had recorded them, and Daryl is a very good friend, and we were talking about that, and and I was lamenting that they were for tenor, and I think word came to you, and all of a sudden shows up on my my email a brand new PDF in baritone key, which uh, I, I I loved and enjoyed. I I'm, I'm going to in full disclosure, I have not sung them yet publicly. I was thinking this would be the perfect opportunity, and then this bloody tenor showed up and decided to sing them. So. I promise you, I'm going to get to them for for two reasons. One, uh, your music is really very beautiful, and your vocal writing is extraordinary. And also, I'm I'm a, I'm just a huge Langston Hughes fan. I'm I'm thinking about putting together a whole Langston Hughes recital of my own, um, but uh, which is easy to do. There's so many so many settings of his poems. But well done. Where did you first come across Langston Hughes? Well, it, it, I came across him not long after I came to America, because I actually grew up in Scotland. I was going to ask you that. Yeah, give us a Wikipedia of where you come. You have an extraordinary history. I'm, I'm deeply curious. Well, it, it is kind of unusual. My, my parents uh, came to England from Jamaica. My father was a jazz trumpet player. And they, they traveled north and ended up in Aberdeen, Scotland. So I went to school there and I went to, I'm giving you a quick resume of my life. Please, please, it's fascinating. I, I went to university in Edinburgh and I went to Milan to study classical piano. I went back to Scotland. I started doing concerts and I was teaching, of course. And then I got interested in jazz and I decided to become more, 
more and more of a serious interest for me. So I decided to pack up and go to Boston to go to Berkeley School of Music to study jazz. And when I was there, uh, I met the lady who became my wife. So she uh, uh, began introducing me to African-American authors. I didn't know very much at all, because at that time, you know, in, in British education, they didn't talk about uh, American, <laughs> culture, American culture hardly at all. So, well, it's an, for, for the English, it's an oxymoron. <laughs> yeah, I American, know. American culture, never mind. Anyway, so I remember one of the books she gave me to read was Langston Hughes' The Big C. So I read that, I was enthralled by it. And I just had this feeling that you know, uh, there was, I had more to explore with Langston Hughes. Mm. Now, I can't remember exactly how it happened, but I started teaching at San Diego State and uh, it was after a conversation with Daryl Taylor. I, I can't remember exactly what we said. Anyway, I went to the Isn't isn't, Dar isn't, isn't Daryl as well at San Diego State? <laughs> No, he's at uh, UC Irvine. UC <laughs> Irvine. Anyway, I went to the library and I got the the the, the complete poems, which is about this thing. <laughs> and I just went through the the book of poems, and you know, there's no way I could read them all, but I just made a short list of poems that I felt uh, spoke to me particularly strongly. So at that time, I didn't know anything about settings by other composers. I had no idea, mm. just didn't, which was a good thing because I, I wasn't influenced by anybody else's settings, you know, Howard Swanson, Margaret Barnes, or anybody. I just didn't know those things. So I, I just set about setting those poems. And the first one I did, let me think now, uh, I think it was mm. the, the Rivers. Right. And then I sat, uh, uh, I too sing America. And then pretty quickly I had five. And Darrell gave the premiere of the cycle at UC Irvine many years ago. And uh, well, that's briefly what happened. So it was kind of an interesting chain of events. Because uh, the other thing for me was that uh, before writing the Langston Hughes cycle, I set a, a cycle of poems by Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Right. And before I did that, I was writing instrumental music. I didn't think I could write for voice because I thought I was so deeply connected to playing the piano. Right. Classical and jazz piano. I had a jazz group in Brooklyn. You know, I thought, well, I'll just have a go and see what happens. And there's this wonderful poem by Dunbar called Love's Apotheosis. And uh, I wrote it for my jazz quintet, first of all. Then I arranged it for just piano and voice. And quite honestly, quite literally, doing that changed my life. I found, I got a lot of feedback from many really good professional singers, and they, they liked the way I wrote for voice. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things that, that just sort of happened. I didn't study how to write for voice. I just did what came naturally. And, here we are. Thank goodness, here we are. You, on, on your, re, reading the biographies, I mean, one, one, first of all, yeah, has to get sort of through the Scotland thing and then, and then back to America. But in fact, you're, I mean, you were quite, you have been very busy as a professional pianist and, and also in the, in the classical idiom as well, not only jazz. And and is that kept on going, or did you sort of have you did did you do did you want that to go farther as a professional pianist, or didn't or did composition sort of take over, or what kind of mixture of your life do you have now? Well, as I get older, you know, uh, it, it's really hard to do everything. So playing <laughs> music, playing jazz, and composing, it's really hard to do all of that to the highest possible level. So True. now. Uh, I have less desire than I used to have to perform, but I have more desire to compose. Mm -hmm. Because I, I mean, one, one simple rationalization is that, well, there are lots of good pianists <laughs> in both idioms the world over. But I, I feel that as a composer, I have a, a singular voice. So apart from 
the passions I feel, it makes perfect sense to work on composing. Wonderful. Before we leave the piano, was there a particular period of piano literature that, that you specialized in or were focused on? Well, I, I Chopin, Mozart, uh, Rachmaninoff. <laughs> well, I, I love Rachmaninoff. Oh. Uh, I've probably driven my colleagues at San Diego State a little crazy because I, I fail off the Rachmaninoff. But basically from Beethoven, through well the 20th century i, I also played mm. michael tippett so uh, I, I guess the main people would be beethoven chopin brahms ravel prokofiev no so it's you were right in the heart of the literature yes yeah and is it is it i mean i i so admire you you know classically trained over classical musicians but also the jazz side and, and improvisation and all that but is there a, is there a kind of schizophrenia in in that i mean mildly and 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 and, and calmly asked but i i mean do you have to sort of focus okay tonight i'm writing word i'm right I'm, I'm 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 playing music that doesn't move around <laughs> there's no well, conversation here yeah well that's a <laughs> different conversation question. Uh, cause I went to grad school at Rutgers after Berkeley and I had two great pianists as piano teachers for jazz, mm -hmm. I had the great Kenny Barron and for classical music, wow. I had the great Ted Ledford. So I'd see them both every week and get musically beaten up by both of them. <laughs> <laughs> but it was Ted who encouraged and me. Pay, to... And paying for the privilege. <laughs> but it was wonderful. I mean, it was, it, was one of the, it was a special time in my life. It really was. I had two master musicians who were helping me. You know, it was great. But Ted was the person who encouraged me to do both things. And actually, it was when I was there that I started composing. And the reason in the style that I write it now. The reason why that happened was quite simple. I heard a couple of interviews uh, with well-known jazz players and they said, well, they arrived at this style because they just drew on what they heard growing up and it was all part of their current style. So I thought, well, I'm writing these jazz tunes, but there's something missing. And I thought, well, I grew up hearing classical music and jazz. I had I heard jazz before I was born. My father loved Ellington. He had his big Ellington, his old extended play, 78s. I love it. That was part of our Sunday ritual. We put on these, these pieces like black, brown, and beige. And oh, yeah. Oh, so, yeah. So I grew up hearing that. I grew up hearing uh, the jazz pianist Bud Powell. But my mother, bought classical records. So I heard Tchaikovsky's Swan Lake and Sweet Her Sleeping Beauty. There was this really great classical pianist I heard called Shura Tcherkovsky. And it was that record that made me want to learn the piano. So oh, wow. fast forward to, to when I was a grad student, I thought, well, I grew up in both kinds of music. So it would make sense for me to combine these two things in terms of being artistically honest because both things are part of me. Mm -hmm. So I wrote some preludes and uh, I'm, I'm very flattered that people still like them and want to play them and ask for the music. But as I said, Ted Letfern was the person who encouraged me to do both things. So I did concerts where I have a, a classical half and a jazz half. And at first, I can't can imagine it's got to be difficult. <laughs> at first, it was hard because you're right, you've you got to switch mindsets and it's, it's, it's not easy. But now I've been doing it for so long that I don't really think about it anymore. So yeah. I'm, glad I, I'm glad I took that step because I think that, well, it's like that phrase, you know, two sides of the same coin, both things, exp each thing expresses part of my personality. And you put the two things together, then that's the complete picture of who I am. If I do just one, either one, I always feel, well, that's fine, but there's something else I need to express, like kind of express but it's, one or the other. 
it sounds like the way you, the way you describe it, it sounds like you you came to composing. What does that uh, mean? Well, it's yes and no. I remember as a kid, I I, I started composing. Well, I remember oh, okay. when I was ten, I wrote my first piece, and it was called like what kids do was programmatic, of course, right? It was called Saturday morning. <laughs> so <laughs> the idea of the piece was to describe the, the chaos involved in getting me to my piano lesson on time on Saturday morning. So the piece was kind of crazy. It had, you know, sudden modulations and false relations. <laughs> so looking back at it, I, I didn't know that terminology, I'm just a kid, but I somehow I knew the structure of chords. Well, you know, in the British system, there's a really good theory program, so I knew that, but uh, I, I just seemed to know more than I should have known for that age. I wrote that piece, I wrote another piece, I wrote a few pieces, and at a certain point, I was trying to do more, do things that were beyond my level of knowledge. So I got frustrated. But then I would also just improvise. I remember a few years later, I would take Debussy Preludes, play the first couple bars, then just improvise on basic theme. It was purely intuitive. It wasn't jazz, it was just improvisation. But then I, I stopped because I was getting older, there was more schoolwork, there was less time to practice. So I just had to, as the teacher would say, practice your pieces, you know, so I, I lost touch for that. I didn't come back to composing until I rediscovered jazz in my mm -hmm. middle twenties, And I was listening to a lot of modern jazz, uh, people like Herbie Hancock, for example. Oh my. So in my father's record collection, it was mostly older stuff. So I discovered Herbie Hancock and Chick Career, and I was enthralled with these modern sounds. So again, I thought, well, I wanted to make songs like those. So I started again, but I, I wrote some jazz tunes, but I still play. But when I decided to combine the two kinds of music, I really felt I found my voice. And, right. And that's the thing for performers and composers. You know, there's so many great examples of great performers, great composers that the problem is is to carve out your own identity right the composer because you know especially in our modern world there's so much information that's just there at our fingertips so it's it's really hard not to get swallowed up by the tradition or in my case there are two traditions there's the jazz tradition and the European tradition. Mm. But I just felt that when I started combining those two things, I found what was right for me. Well, glad you did. Back in, in school, back in, back in school, were you were you a bit of a unicorn, or did, were there other were there other kids your age, either when you were younger, much younger, but also as you came into college, were you did you feel a part of a did you have a group, a support group, and other composers? Well, at university, I wasn't composing. At university, I was just... Yeah, but I mean, even as a musician, were you in... I mean, you had your, your jazz band and so on, your jazz group, but 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 also, I mean, were you, like, playing for the choir or were you the kid that played for the, for the special function or, okay. uh, well, or were there a lot of you playing and be, be, be playing for the orchestra or doing solo work? Did you... Concertos, that sort of thing? Uh, let me think. Well, I... As an undergrad in Edinburgh... I just practiced the piano like crazy, all the big pieces I wanted to play. When I was a grad student at Rutgers in America, a little different, that uh, I played jazz there and I was studying jazz. And I also accompanied a lot of the, the classical students for their recitals and auditions. Oh. So again, I chamber, had- chamber, chamber music as well as singers? Yes. And uh, well, I, I love playing chamber music. Uh, so I always, I've had this sort of dual identity. There's there's the classical me, there's the jazz me. You know, I've, I've managed to make them coexist for years. They're all happy in one house. Yes. 
Now, the last, the last, uh, I think, intersection we had. I mean, you have a wonderful, a wonderful um, uh, bibliography as well as, uh, to some extent, discography. Not nearly as wide as I wish for you, because I think people need to hear your your music. But um, tell me about the Paul Dunbar opera. Okay, well, that that's another story. Uh, oh, good. Uh, I, <laughs> well, stories are good, right? I had heard of Paul Dunbar, but I didn't know much about him. I knew he wrote dialect poetry. That's all I knew. When I was in Brooklyn, I used to go to an Afrocentric bookstore, and a friend of mine worked there. So I went in one day and I saw, uh, I saw the book of Dunbar Complete Poems. So I knew the name. That's all I knew. Mm -hmm. So I bought the book. And as I said, I, I, I actually I wrote the first song "Love's Apotheosis" for a jazz composition competition. So I, I went, I made a short list of maybe a dozen poems, and I chose that one. And I didn't know what was going to happen. I just set it, and it worked out fine. And I didn't win, but I actually won something more than money. I found a new direction in music. Uh -huh. So after, after setting that poem, I was I read a few things about him. I was curious about his life. So I bought some books about his life. And I thought, well, his life story is, is it's an incredible life story. Mm. Uh, it's, it's, it's already naturally operatic. There's so many things. Mm. That it doesn't need any embellishment. So my first thought was not to write an opera because I, it never crossed my mind I could do anything on that scale. I had a very simple idea of just writing some sort of short dramatic piece highlighting one incident in his life. I just thought about it, nothing actually happened. And uh, then I discovered that he courted by letter with Alice Ruth Moore. That was the thing, that was the game changer. So I, uh, all the letters were collected uh, as a PhD thesis. Mm -hmm. So I got the letters and about the same time, this would have been 2002, it's quite a while ago now, a book came out about uh, his life. Uh, I think it's called uh, Lyrics of Sunshine and Shadow. But mm -hmm. it's a very good book because it fills in all the blanks. There are other biographies which, quite honestly, uh, try to steer around the unpleasant things in his life, the negative right. aspects of his being. But that book was very complete. And then I thought, well, this is, this is such a great story. I got to do something more than just one short scene. So I, I spent a year doing research and I plotted out what I thought were the most significant events in his lifetime. And then I started writing the libretto. So the libretto is mostly mine, but I do quote, you know, sentences, uh, phrases, etc., from the correspondence. Right. Again, I didn't know I could write a libretto. So the first thing I did was to do my homework. I thought, well, I'm writing in English. If I'm going to write a libretto in English, the first person I need to look at, uh, the first works I need to look at are the operas of Benjamin Britten, because he's so good at setting the English language. So I looked at Peter Grimes in great detail and Turn of the Screw, mm -hmm. the main pieces. I looked at other operas. I looked at, for example, Barbara's Vanessa, Susanna, uh, Menotti's uh, The Medium, mm -hmm. just to get a sense of sure. 20th century opera as opposed to 19th century or post romantic opera. So I, I did that and I started writing. Uh, well, I don't know if it's going to work, but I'll just write. If it doesn't work, I'll tear it up. So my basic idea was. I'll, if I were in this, whatever character it was, given this situation, given what I know about the character's personality, what would he or she say? That's all I did. And the basic thing I said was, I'll try and make the lines roughly the same length. 
around about eight syllables. I'm not going to have a, a line with 12 syllables or whatever it is, followed right. by a line of three or four. That's going to be hard to set to music. That's how it happens. And then I just, as I said, I had this big notebook, I had all my scenes planned out, I had each scene. When I finished doing that, I started writing music. So before I started writing, I wish I'd recorded it, I just didn't. I, I just started improvising, trying to get a, yeah, a, yeah, oh, yeah. a feel for the-, the And, and were you, you're probably writing, improvising, and singing all at the same time. Well, you see, I, I sing really badly. Uh, <laughs> I must confess. <laughs> but, well, when but, you're alone, who knows? <laughs> exactly, but that's, that's partly why I think I write for voice, because it, it gives me a, a voice. Through, through somebody else, so I can express my thoughts and feelings through somebody else, because I can't do that naturally myself. So, so I wrote it scene by scene. It, it took a very long time, because I was writing it over the summer, or sometimes between classes or on Christmas break. So we had a concert reading of Act One here at San Diego State. And then I wrote the other two acts. We had a concert reading in New York of the whole thing. And then uh, somebody said, you know, Richard, you have to orchestrate this. I thought, oh my gosh, it's two and a half hours. It's going to take forever. <laughs> oh gosh. Anyway, I started and I did it and I finished it. And uh, it was the first performance in New Jersey <clears throat> by Trilogy Opera. And then I started planning to have a professional recording and that's right. how we met and uh, I remember it's such a strong memory for me uh, the first day of recording uh, I stood there in front of the orchestra they didn't know me I didn't know them they didn't know what to expect whether the music would be good bad or indifferent you know and I was a little nervous and we started and uh, it was, I, yes, it was the most thrilling experience of my life to hear the notes on the page come to life, played by excellent music. I can't imagine. I can't imagine. Really good singers. So it was. It was special. It was. Just, I, I guess the main thought I had was, well, what I had in in my mind actually works. I'm hearing. It sounds the way I imagined it was going to sound. And that's a really important thing, because if you're a composer, you, you go through things in your mind, you've got an idea of what it's going to sound like, but you don't really know until you've got people physically playing your music. Whether the I, I can imagine that. I can imagine. I mean, you it as well as you know orchestration and you have the you have the melodies, you have the harmonies, the chords, the progression, all of that, but it could just in real life, have a different color, could have a different thrust, a different center of gravity. But I mean, that must be something you just get better at as you compose more and, and have more experience of doing that. But this, and this is the only opera you've composed? Well, I have I have a, a piece that is, is kind of an opera. It's, uh, let's say it's experimental. It's, it has a sort of a dual state. It's my latest piece, it's called Five Aspects of Othello. So I said, I just saw that. Yeah, I set five soliloquies from Shakespeare's play. So I set the actual text, I, I didn't change anything. And uh, the, part, the part of Desdemona is not sung, it's danced. So I'm, I'm still debating whether I should expand upon this piece and make it into a, more of a regular opera. Of course, inevitably, the first thought is, well, uh, I don't want to compete with Verdi. I want to yeah. have something that's quite different. <clears throat> and I, well, one thing I, I think that ensures that it, that it is and will be different is the fact that I'm actually setting Shakespeare's text. Right. So when I started doing that, my, again, my first thought was, what well, can I do this? This is the great, venerated, venerable Shakespeare. 
can I set his words to music? You know, you know, there's all this cultural weight behind it, you know. It's, right. But to my surprise, when I started doing it, it was a lot of fun because his, uh, as a lot of the books say, the, the critics say, his writing for Othello is very lyrical. It is. So it, it really, uh, uh, it, it really works well when somebody tries to set the text to music. Mm. So and what's important, I think, also is that a lot of people don't know the history behind that play. Well, first of all, it's based on an Italian short story, but more important is the background of the African presence in, in England, specifically London at that time. In fact, uh, Queen Elizabeth wrote something about that, that she was a bit, un I'm paraphrasing of course, she was somewhat uncomfortable by, uh, about the fact that there were so many Africans in London. <laughs> there was a lot of, there's a lot of trade. Oh, going on. some things never change. <laughs> yes, I know, but there's a lot of trade going on. So they were, it wasn't just there as, as, as on vacation. They were there conducting business. You know, so that's part of the background to the story that most people don't know yeah. too much about. And no. that's interesting. What's also interesting is the way that Shakespeare depicts his uh, psychology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I, I'm not a Shakespeare scholar by any means, but I have to wonder whether the way he depicts, depicts Shakespeare, uh, Othello's psychology is, is related to the English perception of what uh, Africans were. I think that's a, I think that's a big subject. I think that's being discussed in, in all the halls today. Yeah, well, by the way, is this is this also for a tenor? Actually, that's that's a great question. Actually, it's it's for bass or bass baritone because I wrote. Oh, for, I love it. I wrote it for Kevin Maynard, who's a, oh sure, a wonderful Kevin, bass, great wonderful bass. calling. By the way, apropos tenors and baritones and so forth, ladies and gentlemen, we have, we're kind of doing this upside down, but that's the fun thing about digital conversations. In fact, Larry Brownlee has shown up from his rehearsal and is okay. anxious to join us in the conversation. So I'm going to open the door and let Mr. Brownlee in. This feels a little bit like the Dick Cavett show. <laughs> hey, Larry, how are you? Hey, how you doing? We're good. We're, we're good. We're having a wonderful conversation on music. Here's Richard Thompson. Okay, hello. <laughs> Let me see if Hi. I can get into the gallery. Hello. Nice to meet hello. you. Nice to meet you as well. I'm trying to get into the gallery view. So, yeah, there we go. Hey. There, there go. we Hi. go. How so, how you? was rehearsal? Oh, uh, good, good. We have a dress rehearsal in a few minutes, but I was actually meeting uh, a friend. Of, I don't, do you know the name Sarah Coburn, soprano? Sure, sure. Yeah, she, she lives in Tulsa. And so, she and I, we met this morning and uh, um, she had to do something with her son's school, so it took me longer to get back to the hotel and everything else. But uh, I'm here now. I'm here. <laughs> no, yeah, ladies and gentlemen, we're having a great time tonight. We've got a couple of guests on here. We're all talking. Larry Brownlee doesn't need any introduction, but here he is, the one and the only. And he's in Tulsa. And Richard, you're in San Diego. Yes. And I'm on Planet X. <laughs> And, uh, and that's, that's the fun thing about the non-geographical digital world. And we're talking about celebration of black music. We're talking about great singers. We're talking about Richard's been taking me through where the cycle came from, that this, you're gonna sing a couple of songs and other works that he's doing. Fascinating uh, history of jazz and classical schizophrenia finally coming together into what we now see as the Richard Thompson before our very eyes. Okay. Anyway, Larry, you have been one busy guy. I mean. First of all, you know, big public congratulations for the Opera News Award. Thank uh, you. You know, thank you. Have you, got, have you got a trophy? Have you got a trophy room by now, like all the big <laughs> golfers, where you just keep, you know, putting this stuff on shelves? <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to follow in your path, and it's a very hard thing to do. But uh, no, I, I don't have enough awards yet to uh, 
to have a room dedicated to that, you know, probably just the, the bottom drawer in my chest of drawers at home uh, works you're, right you're, now. No. You're not old <laughs> enough, Larry. You're not old enough. They just, if you're lucky, you know, you live a little longer. Everyone's wants to say, we know you're not dead here. We'll make you an honorary doctorate. You know, it's, it's very, uh, and I take them all. I love it. I don't get me wrong. It's, 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 uh, it's nice, but look, you've been, you're, you're in Tulsa doing a Beethoven nine, right? That's gotta be I incredible. I mean, did they decide the hell with it? We're going to, it's outside, right? Well, you know, there's been a, the CDC, the CDC has just made a new mandate that if you've been vaccinated, you don't have to wear masks. And so I think Tulsa is a city that for a couple of weeks, actually probably close to a month ago, they've already uh, done away with their mask mandates. And so, um, you know, they're, they decided to do it in Tulsa. And so uh, some people will be socially distant. I think, uh, I imagine that people will wear masks, but it'll be out so outdoor. Uh, in a minor league baseball park. So we'll be on stage and it'll be significant uh, distance between us and uh, the orchestra and the chorus. And so uh, I think it'll be okay. It'll be mic'd. So we'll have microphones. And so, yeah, we're going to, we're going to go ahead with it tonight. Fantastic. You've sung Beethoven nine often, right? Oh, often. No, actually, I probably did it about 25 years ago. Uh, so this is a return when I was in graduate school, I think it was, yes, I'm that old. Uh, that I sang Beethoven's Ninth about, uh, I think it was exactly 25 years ago. And so wow. uh, when I began looking at the part this time, I just thought, oh my gosh, this is foreign. Of course, the melody is very strong in my mind, but uh, uh, some of the inner workings, I'm sure you've probably sung it many times. I, I did uh, sing that, it quite uh, often, even as a, as a baritone, but, but I'm, what I really want to go for is that, is that there are tenors who just love it and do it. And then there's tenors who do it and go, Oh my God! I can't believe I'm singing Beethoven Nine tonight because it, it's kind of one of those—it's kind of one of those pieces that sits in the cracks and goes up where you're not sure. And yeah, I mean, you really got to be on your game, don't you? I mean, even you. Yeah, I mean, you, this because yeah. it's got to fit, but still, it's you know, it's it's not simple. Right. I mean, it's a lot of passaggio singing, and uh, sometimes you you know, at the end of your arietta, if you want to call it that, you have to extend to a high B flat. Uh, exactly. You come to the end of the piece, it start very much lower central part of your voice. And so you just got to, uh, the part's not huge. And so you just kind of have to pace yourself through it. That ascension to the high B flat has tears written all over it. <laughs> 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 so uh, do you feel like, I mean, did, did COVID, I mean, we were talking a little bit with Richard. I mean, we've all been in sort of COVID hell. I mean, even this series, this Idaho Live started as, as the pandemic hit us and it seemed a, a good way to get our, our public and music lovers with performers and composers and all that. So I, you could have, I would have bet you any amount of money that we wouldn't be doing this 12 months later. And yet here we are. Um, I mean that as a, as a COVID project, it's actually taken on a whole new dimension. And I, the Idajo talk series is here to stay. And I, I love visiting with colleagues and meeting new people and meeting new performers. I've had such a wonderful year. I've been doing this twice a week for 12 months. I mean, I took a little bit of the summer <laughs> off, but I think I've got over a hundred interviews now up on, up online, which is really, really, it's just fun. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I embrace the, the digital world. What I really want to ask though, Larry, do you, do you feel, can you feel the lid coming off? Do you, do you feel like we're, there's a momentum getting back to, to performing? Yeah, I do. And I think a lot of people have been really making strides in that direction, uh, not only in the United States, but I recently came back to Tokyo uh, and I got a chance to <laughs> perform uh, there. Uh, but also in Europe, some of my European things, uh, things that were canceled because of COVID are now being placed in situations, concerts and other things. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I've been on the phone with my agent today trying to see if something could fit in a, a tight window. So people are trying to, and I think there is somewhat of a light at the end of the tunnel. And I think people are hopeful that we'll be able to get back to some semblance of normalcy soon. What do you, you say an awful lot in America, what do you do most of your operatic work and, and are those theaters starting to open up again? It's interesting because I, much like I think you've done, because I know you've sung everywhere, you know, but sometimes you have European centric uh, careers that are, you, True. Sing, you sing, sing, sing in four theaters, you know, four major productions and then maybe one of the states. And then the next year it flip flops where you sing the four major productions True. in the United States and then in Europe. And so it's been a balance of the two. Uh, I would say probably that it would be 60, 40 
uh, Europe as opposed to the States. I think the lion's oh, share yeah. of what I do is in Europe. And, you know, I sing a great deal in uh, Zurich and Paris. In the beginning of my key career, I sang a lot of Milan, uh, both Berlin theaters. Um, right. And I've been to London and uh, other places as well. So I do get a chance uh, because Bel Canto, which is what, you know, what I normally sing, uh, is um, done a lot in Europe. Do you remember the first time we met? I think this is true. I, the you, first time, it was, go ahead. The first time you and I met, I'm yeah. pretty sure it was in the cafeteria of Covent Garden. Oh, maybe that's true. That's when true. We I was actually that, thinking, but when you were doing Cenerentola at the I Met, right. I, it, was a, it, was an, it was an HD broadcast, and I was the host that day. And it yes. was, I, I think, with Elena, wasn't it? Carancha. It was Elena, Gar Elena Garancha. And I mean, I what a night at the Belli. Met. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, and Corbelli you, as well. I met you in the in, in the cantina of Covent Garden when we were there. Remember, uh, we were doing the 1984, and it was me and myself exactly. and Nancy Gould That's why and, I met and you Lord, it was Lauren Lauren Mazel's piece. Yeah, Simon Kingley side because I think they had spoken to you about doing that. Uh, but yeah, he never forgave me. <laughs> 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 I mean, I, I, and I, it just, it just, you know, I mean, as projects have to be. I mean, I was a little bit scared of it because it was very complicated music, uh, and I needed a, a lead in time to to learn it and everything. But when it finally became okay, I'm going to do it. Here's the project at the time. I was just in a, a, another uh, doing something else, and also including Covent Garden. But never mind. That's that's our life. Um, yeah. <laughs> talk to me about talk to me about. You sing a lot of songs, don't you? I do. You do a lot of I recitals. Do, I do, and it's one of the things that. Uh, uh, some of the people that I admire a great deal as singers, probably one of my favorites um, was Fritz Wunderlich, who did, of course, he had a big career in opera, but then he seemed to do more song. And uh, he lived a short life. I know he died at either, I think it was 39 years old, either 36 okay. or 39. And, yeah. But this is someone who really enjoyed the repertoire. Uh, I'm a big fan of Gerard Suzet. I'm a big fan of great, uh, great song singers. And so I've always tried to have that balance of both opera and songs as well. Well, you, so, you have to insist on doing that. I mean, I always yeah. had to insist that that is how my life should be. And of course, the people you're referencing are, are my, my mentors as well. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was, you know, in the, in the 60s where Fritz was still very much, by the way, my, my voice teacher was a baritone colleague of his and sang with him very often on stage in Munich and so forth, which is fun. And really? He died, he was, he was 39, very, very tragic. Um, you know, awful accident. But, um, but the point is that it, at that time, it was just, it was just self understood that that being a singer was a singer and you sang concerts and you sang songs and you sang opera. And of course, classical, the, the idea of crossover came much later and, and pretty much only in the American uh, collegium, as it were. Um, well, not so much later, I mean, but anyway, you know what I mean? But it seems it seems that unfortunately more and more we have to remain very proactive as professional singers, especially mm -hmm. singers that, that gain an art notoriety and have a public to say, no, we're going to do concert work. We're going, we, we want to do recitals. What, what the, the flip side of that that concerns me, and this is where Richard may have some thoughts as well, is that presenters today are paranoid about having recital series, but they will do it if it's a famous singer that will sell their tickets. And, mm -hmm. and to turn this magnificent art form of, or, or the, of, of song into sort of a vanity evening or a celebrity turn, uh, you know, is, is, is hard to take. It, it shouldn't be that way. I've, I've been, I always want to say, I thank you for coming. I'm glad you want to come and, and hear me sing, but I want you to come for what I'm going to sing. I want you to, you know, mm -hmm. go, go, go there. It's a, it's a tough, it, do you, do you know what you're, I'm talking about? It's a tough balance. It to is. Find. You have, you have to be intentional in wanting to sing songs. And you know, what happens oftentimes is that organizations will invite you and they'll say, well, if you do songs, the first half, maybe you can do some arias uh, the second half or some favorites or something. And I've been a big fan of, you know, uh, programs that that are really, you know, about song and exploring different yeah. composers. And for yeah. me, it's been a great uh, journey to to study some of these uh, wonderful people like Hina Stera and some of these <sighs> other composers. Uh, um, 
uh, gosh, I'm thinking of him right now. Um, gosh, I can't think of off the top of my head. Uh, but there are a number of different people that I've actually explored and not do, of course, the, the normal list or do park or, or some of the, but to really delve into other repertoire and for people to want to come and appreciate the art of the song cycle, because it is a much different animal than doing uh, the operatic performances. And there is a community that I hope that we can revitalize that really appreciates the actual singing of song literature. Well, and they're about something. They come from something. I mean, the, yes. the, 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 a poem set to music, if it's two art forms, they don't need one another. And they yeah. become a third and unique art form. And this whole, yeah. this whole business of, oh, prima la musica, poi parole, or the backwards, it's just, it's an answer to a question that shouldn't be asked. <laughs> yeah. You know, and am I on the right track with that? You, Mr. Composer, Mr. Thompson, does that make sense? Yes, well, uh you hit on something I was thinking about last night. Uh, first of all, with the song on, and the song cycle, there is a special level of intimacy. Yes. And that to me is really special because there's the singer, there's the piano, usually. Okay? So the, the solo artist, a solo artist, as a chance to tell a story or multiple stories or a trajectory of human experience in a very special way. And there's the time and space to reveal who you are as a human being in this really intimate- Oh, wonderfully put. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry for words here. It is this special- <laughs> So, people have a, a, a special opportunity to connect because you're there, you're vulnerable, you express what you feel you can and have to express, and people can relate to that. And it's, it's really special. It's quite different, of course, to opera because it's, everything is on a larger scale. You've got an orchestra, mm. the whole set of different things that are involved, but with a, with a song recital or song recital, the, the soloist gets up, gets up there and says, this is me. Mm. And you have to show your, your humanity in a special way. And going off in there, you, you're talking about uh, uh, the primacy of words or the primacy of music. And this is idea that somebody's poetry is too great to set to music. The music is going to get in the way. Or conversely, well, this great, great composer set uh, second-rate poetry. Why didn't he set greater poetry? Whatever. I, I, I just don't want to go there. We talked a bit about setting Shakespeare and the sense of intimidation because of the cultural rate, weight of him and other writers. I, I think that's just an illusion. Because if it, if it is great poetry, then if you set it well to music, you're not damaging the poetry, you're enhancing the meaning through another medium. So that to me is a win-win. And if the poetry well, I, isn't that, well, one last thing, if the poetry no, isn't, no. isn't that good, well, you're enhancing something that deserves to be enhanced. So why complain? <laughs> <laughs> but if you accept and i'm gonna i want Larry to respond as well but my first reaction is i have had this conversation obviously a lot and and in in german and french and repertoire that we go through and i'm right now in the middle of a, of a little, small little series with susan Jones on schubert and and we're really drilling down on the on the literary efficacy efficacy of of schubert and it's quite, quite fascinating my point is that is that when a poem hits the the oil of music its poetic elements are, don't, are become musical elements and and it's no longer a poem i don't care whether it's shakespeare or goethe it is it's, it's now part of a if you will metaphorical conversation with the language of music and it becomes a completely different completely different form although the hopefully the context is still going to be alive. And what I, what I mean by that is that just the formula of the best poet and the best composer is not going to give you the best song. Uh, and that's what's fascinating to me. I'm more fascinated by 
a standalone, quote unquote, weaker poetry that becomes a magnanimous and magnificent impulse for a great song. But anyway, Laurie, where are you at? How many songs? You sing an awful lot of songs. It's French is really your <laughs> your second language from, from English. Is that correct? You're more of a well, French I, guy? I'm more I know you speak Italian. German as well. What? My, my Italian is my best language, to be, to be honest. But I, speak, uh, I speak enough French and enough German to get by. Uh, but, uh, you know, this discussion of the words with the music, this, right. this collision, I, I really think that when you were both talking about lesser poems can all oftentimes become more meaningful because the beauty of the voice. And this is one of the things I early on in my career, I used to list so many different emotions that I think a piece goes through. And it's just not happy and sad, but all the expressions of happy, the different levels. And what we have is the unique ability to find the colors in our voice to make that mean something. Wow. And if we could Bravo. sit on the word, if we can sit on the word in the right way or capture the atmosphere of the weight of a word. I mean, if you hear, if you hear the word storm and you can truly find the vocal color to make that mean something, then that's where the poetry comes to life. So I, uh, I think we have a, a wonderful opportunity uh, to express poetry in a way when we have this marriage of the music with the poetry. I do. Oh, I agree with you completely. Well, and well put and well said. Let's go to the American idiom. Uh, let's go to the American language. That's been one of my fascinations. My thesis is that American, well, arts and uh, arts and performing arts in general are like a diary of our extremely volatile, fast, confusing, contrarian culture. And and I and I mean that lovingly in all of those adjectives. Um, what what I've always was allergic to, and and it became a kind of a responsibility for me in, in the early part of my career was, was this continual plaguing question in academia in America. Well, who's our Schubert? Well, who's our Brahms? Well, what about our Debussy? What in this night in the 20th century and so forth and so on? And, and then Barbara comes along or Roram comes along. I said, oh, well, you know, that's very much yada, yada. And it just never made any sense to me because also mainly because, and Richard, you may respond to this. I know some phenomenal songs by some unknown composers and went and got the rest of their songs and to my utter horror, <laughs> That didn't happen. It, those those three great songs are the three great songs, you know. Okay. <laughs> and that was and it. they're in, the and, and they're inevitably in a particular time frame. And that's where I really came and said, look, we need to look at American culture through ten and fifteen year maximum prisms of who's creating in that time to let them tell us the story of what's going on. Does that resonate with you, Richard, as a composer? Yes, I, I think there's a, a real problem with. Uh, phrases like the American Schubert or the American Brahms, because you're, you're, you're uh, transporting somebody from a different age and a different culture mm. and saying, well, I need, we need to have an American equivalent. So I, I think it's a, a, a more, it, it's, it's more valid not to make those comparisons. We need to find people who are addressing life in America, the American experience. Right. Not, well, this person is equivalent to Schubert or Debussy because he or she is doing this the way th they did it in their country a hundred years ago or more. That, that's kind of setting yourself up for, for failure, I think. I mean, it's. Uh, it's, it's all that about, makes sense. Well, thank you. I, I think it's all about being sufficiently knowledgeable and sensitive about what's happening here and now. Of course, having the talent to express those things musically in a way that resonates with people. You don't need to say, well, so, you know, uh, so and so is, is writing the way, is doing the modern equivalent of Schubert, because you, you're putting on a mantle, a heavy mantle, mantle on somebody, which shouldn't shouldn't be done. We are all here and now, so we're all defined by when and where we live. It's like the other silly uh, phrase people say. Well, if if uh, Beethoven were alive today, he would like da 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 da. That's artistically 
phony because Beethoven was defined by when and where he lived. Exactly. Beethoven was Absolutely. walking down 7th Avenue in New York in 2021. Well, that wouldn't be Beethoven. That'd be somebody else. So it's, mm -hmm. it's about, so it's, it's about uh, identity, really. You know, especially right now because there's been so much focus on uh, the identity of the African American identity, the African American experience. Well, if you're going to do that, you're not going to think about what Schubert did. No, not because Schubert wasn't great. Of course, he was great. But it's but not, great. It's, and it's not contrary. I mean, Schubert becomes the muse in in that sense. But I was thank you for bringing that up. I mean, we're obviously sitting together, ladies and gentlemen, on and having this conversation because we're. Um, it's such a privilege to to have conversations with all the various colleagues that that are going to join me in, in in Hamburg. We're doing this wonderful Song of America celebration of Black music. Uh, and I can't tell you, Larry, when we had contact and I asked you and you just immediately said, oh, yeah, we got to make that work. That sounds <laughs> that sounds like that sounds fun. And then what was remarkable, Richard, is we as everybody started pooling their ideas and repertoire, especially for the two chamber evenings, we'll have two two evenings of recitals with six recitalists all having about 15 minutes in the evening and ping ponging as it were through the repertoire. The first night is dedicated to Langston Hughes, first in German and then on through. And that's where your marvelous songs come up. And that's where we, you know, Larry have a look at these and he said, oh yeah, this will do. But I'll let you tell that story. <laughs> the second <laughs> evening is, uh, I know why the caged bird sings. It's a wonderful quote and it's a panorama of, of uh, African-American composers and poets. And yes, it is all only black American composers and black American uh, poets, which is very exciting. And then the third evening uh, is a is an orchestral concert, uh, which will have orchestral pieces by Valerie Coleman, uh, as well as ending with the magnificent William Dawson Negro Symphony, which I believe has never been played on the European continent. Uh, really? and, wow. and George Walker showing up as well in the reflective piece. And then we're doing uh, excerpts from William Grant Still's opera, Highway One, and if you've never heard of it, welcome to the club. It's fantastic. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge William Grant Steele fan as well. Uh, but also, Larry, and now, we'll, now I'm circling all around, leaving that you're going to do a, a, a group of spirituals, which is wonderful. And you've done a marvelous record. By the way, last week I had a conversation with Damien Sneed. Got to know him. You know, <laughs> yeah. that's like that's like putting your finger in a light socket. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, Thank you, I love. You know, because we're talking about European literature, we're talking about different languages, we're talking about Schubert, we're talking about contemporary, we're now talking about the Black experience. Can you wrap that all up in one? You sing all sorts of stuff, and you sing spiritual, you sing uh, African-American composers, but you told me you've actually sung more spirituals from the spiritual base of, of the repertoire than you actually knew or had been singing contemporary or even non-contemporary African-American composers, as it were. Um, but I guess my question is, what is it? I, I, it's not really a question. I know you, and I and I know that when you do this, when you have a recital where you can embrace all these different voices and all these different cultures in one evening, especially as an African American artist, that's got to feel good. That's got to <laughs> feel right. You know, is it, riff it feel, go? <laughs> you know, it, it feels good. It feels good, and you know, I feel a unique. Uh, responsibility, but also an honor to present the music of wonderful co composers, uh, living, breathing composers that I just probably in the last five years have gotten the opportunity to uh, to really explore their repertoire. And yes, I'm, I get the chance of getting to do some of your music, uh, <laughs> Maestro Thompson, and all of us. Thank you so much. To, to know some of these others, you know, Maestro Owens and Spencer and so many others. It's just, it's a great opportunity for us to do it. Of, you know, as a young student, I knew of the music of Burley. I knew of the music yeah. of some of these other composers. Even Coleridge Taylor has become more uh, in part, True. I think, Hale, Adolphus Hale Stork has become more recently um, kind of like surveyed. Uh, but for us now, we're finding there's a trove in having tremendous resources like Louise and, you know, uh, Daryl Taylor and some of these other people yeah. who know the repertoire they're introducing us and the great thing is now not that it's the end thing but a lot of us are so excited to delve into all that's there 
all that is available, all that is at our disposal to tell the experience because we have a platform now. Of course, some of the social issues uh, have provided us more of a focused spotlight on our experience. And I, and I believe that people who don't look like us are ready to uh, experience it. And I feel like uh, the responsibility that I do feel is that we have this obligation to make sure that these composers become a part of the regular canon uh, of the writers that are performed in recitals, not only by Bravo. black people, but also other people and to show that there is importance in the music. But what often happens is a person who's not black, they won't take on this repertoire because they feel it's just about the black experience. And it's not, it's about the, Ameri the American experience. And I think you have to be smart. If you have some subject material that is specifically focused on the black experience, you have to go with wisdom. But I think there is an incredible amount of music that talks about beauty, and love and so many other things that should be, it's an education opportunity that we have that everybody should be singing these songs for the, for the foreseeable future. Well, we could pretty much end the interview right there. I mean, that's, that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> that's my passion. That's what, you know, I mean, uh, like, like, like I've said before, you know, Langston Hughes, Langston Hughes is my poet. I'm an American. Mm -hmm. This is an American poet. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's an African American poet, and none of this poetry is a, is a very is about me. It's not about trying to have the black experience. It's about identifying with. It's the it's the empathy. It's the it's the it's the story of of human lives, and you know it's the timeless stuff of human lives. Is for me, I love that metaphor of one river and many wells, and mm -hmm. and and if and if and by drilling somebody else's well, if you will, to keep the metaphor going. Is, is a sign of respect, and it's also very educative. I have learned a lot about Black in America through great poetry. Dunbar as well, County Colon, you know, mm -hmm. Langston Hughes. I mean, there's a, yeah, oh, my God, James Baldwin. It would have been nice if people would have listened to James Baldwin when he was alive. You know, at mm -hmm. least he's having a renaissance again. What an incredible intellect and, and articulation. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I really appreciate you saying what you said about embracing this from all sides of our culture and white people and, and Asian people and whoever is going to sing each other's poetries and songs. That is my passion. That's why I wanted to do this, this project. Now, everybody's got to hold hands and hold each other's coats because n no more can we say we're, I, we are having a black experience, then we want to be accused of cultural appropriation. And, and you're right, it is to be smart, it's to be sensitive and to be open with one another. The two people I went to at the beginning of all this project were Daryl Taylor at the African American Song Alliance, and of course, the magnificent uh, Louise Taupin, Dr. Louise Taupin, the great scholar soprano and that marvelous African diaspora uh, music site that she's created, which is just an am amazing database of, of music. Encyclopedia. And, and encyclopedia as well, as, so that we can start just as you said, Larry, just as you said, we can, from all sides, make this music, which is for everybody, audible. It, mm -hmm. it, this is what's incredibly important. And that's why also in Hamburg, I called up Christoph Lieben. He was on the show the other day and uh, way back in the fall. And I said, there's such, an, there's such a sympathy in Europe for Black Lives Matter. Wouldn't it be great to have some concerts and hear what we're talking about? <laughs> and he said, yes, <laughs> so let's do it. And that's where all of this, all of this started. And that all of you wonderful colleagues, uh, uh, you know, just immediately signed on and said, this is something we have to do. Nobody's getting rich, but we'll eat well and have a, and have a <laughs> hell of a time. And it's, and it's all digital because of COVID. Germany is still fighting pretty hard and, and big presentations are not possible. So we will film it live on 26, 27, and 31st May, and it will be then broadcast the following week as live performances, which I think is uh, gives us a lot of exciting room to 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 produce uh, material and 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 lead-ins and information and so forth. You know, I was going to ask you in terms of spirituals, Larry. Um, and just in closing, Roland Hayes, the great, uh, the great African American tenor who had an incredible European career. I love the story about Roland Hayes walking out on stage and being booed before he opened his mouth. 
Yeah. I don't know that story. Oh my gosh. Oh my God. He did. He, he walked on a stage. I don't know what, what if, if, Kira Thurman, who's a, who's a specialist in all of this is doing our notes and I'll ask her where I forget exactly where it was, but, but it was just anti-black. It was like, you know, recital leader abend you know what what is this guy doing and he walks out and it was you know quiet and stern faces and boo and he immediately looked at his pianist and said we're doing the schubert group first <laughs> and he just turned around and sang du bist die ruhe im frühling some other things and by the end of the group by the end of by, by the end of the first half of the concert people were standing up and from that moment forward, and, and somebody asked him about it afterwards, and he said, it isn't about me. It's about Schubert. Yeah. And then, of course, he, and what I really want to go is at the end, the end of the concert, he always sang spirituals. But how he described the spirituals that he programmed was more like a, like, I, I, want, I, don't, I forgive the phrase folk music, but, but that he was telling stories of the folk experience of the black experience through mm -hmm. the chosen spirituals. Is that what you do? It is, you know, and when I sing spirituals, I don't only sing what's on the page, perhaps, but it's infused with what? an understanding. <laughs> Close your eyes. Close your ears, Richard. Close your ears. Don't be but I, but I think that, you know, especially with spirituals, there is the, the extra oil on it that you bring uh, the recent history of your ancestors and the experience that you've lived that is a part of it. The moaning and the, I mean, the, the urging of how you use the text, it's all wrapped in the experience. And so uh, that's what it is. I'm telling a story, I'm trying to, and I feel like if you call back to the stories you've learned about your ancestors working in the fields and singing amongst themselves and how they used to use music and you think about the church experience where they would sing and you people would, sing in harmony without any instrumentation and how music was this real, uh, this, this vehicle or vessel to transport an idea, to transport you in or out of a place. So yes, that is with some passion and urging and nuance and, and the small things, the small details that oftentimes, you know, the true essence of what it is is not necessarily on the page, unless you have a con, you know, composer that says, this needs to be with feeling, what does feeling mean? That for everybody, that may be a different experience. So spirituals very much for me is about trying to tap into something, having the cool head and the warm heart, not the hot head uh, and the cool right. heart, you know, but really, you know, this thing saying, you know, I really want to speak from my heart and to give them an, ex let somebody tap into what is that that he has? You know, but I, that's what I think the beauty of spirituals can do because it is its own uh, unique and separate animal that I yeah. think deserves to be done uh, as much as possible. I get the feeling that what you also just described, however, is in the is in the hands of of wonderful song composers, and and I get that feeling of care and and impulse in your music, Richard. This is this is what. What what I hear, I hear this in, this in, this intentional ringing of the heart and and carrying carrying through. Are you having fun learning these songs, Larry? I am. <laughs> I think they're in good hands, Richard. I think they're in well, good I, hands. I, I can't wait to hear. I, I, I'm I'm really thrilled about this. It's, it's really a well, special I have to... huge thing. It's really very special. Yeah, it's, it's going to be it, great. It's, it's, yeah, it, it, and you just have to respect it and really you know you. you a lot of times you get the indication, you know, great composers give you the indication with the music, with the dynamics and all. I mean, you have all the, what do you call it, the road, the road markings uh, uh, of the direction you're meant to go. And then uh, I always say that we're not, we're not tape recorders regurgitating information. You know, we right. are artists that are creating arts and we're creating art. And so we're given the palette, we're given the colors, we're given everything else. And if you give these instructions to five different people with the canvas in front of them, you'll probably get five different things. And so that's the beauty about our artistic license as well, that we get this opportunity within the confines of what the composer says to create something unique. And that's what I, I'm always on that journey to try to do that. That's why you are Larry Brownlee. 
and you are one of the most important artists in front of us today. I can't, I tell you, Larry, I'm serious. I'm, I'm an older colleague. I'm still singing. I'm having a great time and so forth. But every once in a while, you look back and say, who's coming? And when you, when you came up and you just are who you are, I just, you know, I sleep well at night because you're there. But I'm not going to sleep well if we don't stop this interview and you shut up. You've got a show tonight. I don't care if it's 16 bars or 60 bars. you got to go out and sing Beethoven and you've got a bloody high B flat, you know, so... <laughs> I'll do. <laughs> I'll pay. Go, have a, go have a nap. Go have a nap. You know, whatever. I wanted to talk to you there about you being go. in quarantine in Tokyo. That's got to be a nightmare. I wanted to ask you, Richard, about trying to leave fingerprints on scores so that idiot singers won't mess it up. But that'll be our next conversation. We're going to close this out, <laughs> you guys. Yeah, it's uh, Richard. I hope you're happy. It'll be fun to hear I how am, you feel the I'm concerts go. I'm thrilled and honored by all of this. This has been a wonderful experience, and I, I can't wait. I'm so happy to be a part of this project. It is very meaningful for me. I'm, I'm really we are too humble. Should be happy you know, thank you so much. I said to Larry, I said, if you don't sing them, I will. So, you know, whatever. <laughs> but he's he's on the program. I mean, hello. Yeah, yeah, anyway, exactly. No, this is going to be right, fun. Larry, it's, it's going to be fun. See you, see you in 10 days. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, that is our, our, our show tonight. Thank you very much for joining us, idadjo.com. And yes, these concerts will be also on idadjo. You will be able to watch them as well. But check it out, Elp Philharmonie, E-L-B-P-I-H, where you get the idea, dot D-E. We'll leave, it, we'll leave it in the notes. Gentlemen, thank you. Thank Wonderful. you so much. Great to be meet well. you. Thank you so much. Have a good time tonight. Thank you. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. Bye-bye. Bye for now.